Good afternoon. We're going to talk about test stations and we're going to talk about Cleveland. And we are from two trade associations that represent the uh, sourcing side and the sinking side of uh, broadcasting. I'm Len Claudie from NAB. And this is my partner in crime, Brian Mark Walter from the Consumer Technology Association. Hi, w welcome to NAB show. So we do the other show in January. It's good to be up here with Lynn Claudie. Uh, CTA and NAB are funding the Cleveland uh, test station effort. So we're, we're really happy to be here. Lynn's done the bulk of the work. I don't know if you want to keep going. I do not intend to stand up here and pretend like I directed uh, this effort or had much to do with it. I can say that from CTA's perspective, the receiver and TV side, we're very excited to be working with NAB. You know, this has been a, this is always a dual effort, broadcast and receive side. So we're excited now that uh, UHD TVs have been in the market for four or five years. We're excited to be uh, on the cusp of introducing ATSC 3.0 TVs into the market. Thank you, Brian. Uh, as you can see, we're the uh, the main sponsors of this test station. It's an experimental station in Cleveland. We've been on the air in a few for a few years. Uh, this is done at a Tribune station, WJW in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, kind of a circuitous path how we came to host this station in, in Cleveland. But it turns out they had a channel that was available, and actually an RF transmission plant that wasn't being used, and it was a licensed. Uh, frequency, so uh, we put it on the air, and we decided we'd have everyone who wanted to could come to the station and try out equipment, both professional equipment and consumer equipment, and figure out how do we make this ATSC 3.0 thing work, and how do we provide a venue and a, a platform for people to work out problems. So that's kind of what we've been doing. Uh, we think of it as a what? Do, what do we think of it as, Brian? <laughs> Test facility and living lab, just like it says here. So, um, you know, we've uh, there's there's several opportunities you you'll see here. There's there's a number of places that are transmitting ATSC 3.0. The I think the importance of the Cleveland is we we see it as a as a, this neutral test facility that we're we're trying to make um, a, a place where TV manufacturers can go to understand to do some experimentation. Uh, sort of different premise from the, the Phoenix um, test that's going on, the model market. And so we're excited to be uh, doing this effort now for a couple of years, I guess, and we will continue through this year advancing the work at the test station. And then I think I'm going to step down because Lynn's going to go through some of the details of the results. Okay. And I'll stay here and be available for questions at the end. Great. Well, we can't do this alone, so uh, we've got a lot of people that are working with us to provide equipment, to provide advice, to provide uh, their their wisdom. Uh, this is the list we have at the moment. There are probably a, a few more that, that should be on that list, uh, but it's a, it's a growing community of people trying to figure out what to do. So, like I said, this is in Cleveland. Uh, it's in, actually in Parma, Ohio, about 12 miles south of Cleveland. And uh, we're up at uh, pretty high antenna height. We've got um, a lot of power there uh, in a 600 kilowatt transmitter that we derate a little bit, but it's a high power transmission facility. Uh, WJW itself is now a VHF station. The reason we got this channel was during the DTV transition, their transition channel was channel 31. And then after the transition, they decided to go back to channel eight and turned off the lights on, on the uh, channel 31 transmitter and just sat there. So it was that they were waiting for us. But this is a great facility because it, it used to be their studio. So it, it uh, now is just a transmitter facility, but it has a lot of space. So you can have a workroom, you can have meetings there. Uh, you, there's a shop, you can bend metal and drill holes to your heart's content. A lot of storage, you can even uh, park a vehicle inside the building and in Cleveland in the winter you definitely want to be parking inside the building. So that's what uh, our rack configuration uh, looked like a f uh, about a month ago with uh, all the various uh, contributors of uh, equipment showing what they have. And we've now got a pretty big history of stuff that we've done. It really started back in 2016 uh, using prototype equipment to uh, look at high VHF 
transmission. I think we're still the only facility that has tested a high VHF band. <clears throat> At the time, it was when stations had to uh, elect uh, what where they were going to stay or whether they were going to go to another channel in the incentive auction. And there was a lot of question about what's the future value of VHF. So we did some early, uh, early tests uh, on VHF. Uh, then we did um, some uh, um, typical kinds of uh, field tests in uh, 2018. Uh, and more recently in um, March of this year, ending in March of this year, some layered division multiplexing uh, tests, uh, both fixed and mobile. And I'll talk about uh, those, um, probably go through them pretty quickly, but uh, we want to show those to you. Using this facility actually goes back before CTA and NAB were involved. Uh, if you uh, remember before ATSC 3.0, there were a bunch of competitors, one of which was uh, LG and Gates Air together and Zenith, called the Futurecast system. And they, uh, they were the first ones to try out uh, RF transmission in, in Cleveland. They had a bus and they had some fixed uh, receivers. Then uh, after we took over the facility, we did uh, testing in uh, Channel 9, adjacent to the Channel 8 uh, facility. We used their auxiliary Channel 8 antenna and operated on Channel 9. So we learned a lot of things out of that. <clears throat> Principally, the system works in the, in the real world, and that was a real question back in 2016. We didn't find any red flags for VHF operation itself, and we found out if you want to know if the system's going to work or not, figure out what your absolute signal level is because low signal level is the enemy of all digital systems. Uh, if you don't have enough signal level, nothing else matters about how good the system is. So we found out that there's a lot of flexibility in ATSC 3.0 that we don't have in 1.0 that can help you with that. And uh, we also kind of started to learn then about single frequency networks and the advantages that they can eventually bring to the, uh, to the broadcasting market. Uh, we also found out that you still need good tuners and receivers. When you're operating on uh, channel nine and there's a big analog uh, transmitter on channel eight and we were short spaced to a channel 10 uh, uh, transmitter, uh, you still need tu good tuners and television sets. There's no substitute uh, for, for doing that. Uh, we also know there's a lot more VHF now than, uh, than, there w than, than there was before the incentive auction. So stations closer together, both geographically and in frequency means you got interference, good tuners. It's a good way to, uh, to, to get out of some of that. First thing we did that was kind of re reality-based was uh, you, you may remember Cleveland was in the World Series back in 2016. And uh, at the last minute, we, we got uh, some, uh, had an idea. I think John Taylor had the idea. And uh, the, the network agreed that said, hey, they're playing a game in Cleveland. Why don't we put it on the air in ATSC 3.0? And uh, that's what we did. We found out we could do that. We had their transmission facility and uh, we put it on the air and we, uh, we broadcast it to two receivers. One was in the truck. The other was in the transmitter uh, building. Nonetheless, it was RF transmission of ATSC 3.0 of a World Series game. And I don't remember whether Cleveland won or not. I don't think they did. But uh, they did win. Okay. They didn't win the series. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was a great moment for uh, being able to figure out how well this stuff, stuff works. <clears throat> Fast forward a couple of years. Everyone decided, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could do the 2018 Olympics in 4K? And uh, we were able to do that. We weren't the only ones that did that. WRAL uh, did it in uh, North Carolina, and they did it before we were able to get on air. <clears throat> but we did get permission from uh, NBC, got their 4K feed that they were feeding Comcast systems with, and uh, demodulated it, and then remodulated it in ATSC 3.0. and. By the time hockey was on, which was the last event in uh, the Olympics, uh, we were we were broadcasting. So you can see there's some hockey there live on a on a TV set, and uh, there's uh, Dennis Wallace and R.J. Russell from uh, MSW uh, at the closing ceremonies of the the Olympics. So we had some birthing pains getting the thing going, but we finally did. So we were able to show Olympics in 4K uh, from uh, from Cleveland. 
2018, we did some fairly extensive uh, field tests. Uh, using the facility, we derate down to 437 kilowatts for the transmitter and uh, using a van uh, with a directional antenna at 30 feet and 12 feet. We went all around Cleveland. Now our receiver was a uh, uh, Clever Logic receiver. Thank you, Etri, for the uh, professional receiver that um, uh, still is the best in the business, I think. And uh, inside the measurement van, you can see uh, that's the actual, where, where the red circle is, that's the um, uh, status panel for the, uh, for the receiver. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. You see uh, different, you see the program content. You can tell the things about the signal, what kind of modulation, what the various signal parameters are, and something about the signal uh, reception conditions. So you get a lot of information at every site you go to, which is pretty neat. And we went all over the place, out to uh, 60 miles on uh, five uh, radials, 59 sites there. We did a couple of grids uh, in uh, Akron and, and in Cleveland and uh, a couple of clusters in the uh, far suburbs out there. So um, we had 100 sites total. So 100 sites and um, two different antenna heights and four different signals. Great thing about ATSC 3.0 is you can do the multiple things at the same time. So we had four physical layer pipes and they each did uh, something, uh, something different. When we went all the way from very high robustness but low data rate up to very low robustness and high data rate. And you can see how well the system uh, receives those uh, signals independently at, at each location. So 100 sites, two antenna heights, four different PLPs. You start getting into a, a, a large data set. So these would be the raw data rates that each of those physical layer pipes uh, could support all the way from 28 megabits per second down to four megabits per second. Of course, we're multiplexing them all together, time multiplexing them, so we don't actually get the, that full throughput on any of those, but the instantaneous data rates uh, would, uh, would apply there. So, higher the data rate, lower the robustness, higher the robustness, lower the data rate. That's kind of the mantra. So field test results from uh, that little exercise. Uh, these are the, the two antenna heights and the four different uh, PLPs. And you can see we're up very, very high in the uh, uh, percentage, uh, certainly with the high robustness, uh, virtually at 100% there. So uh, when you look at just the sites that had signal levels that are higher than the threshold, we call that system performance index, where you take the number of good sites and divide it by the, the, the number of measurement sites, but limit it to just where you had enough signal level, because those are the only places you have a chance uh, to get reception. Then the percentages went up uh, even higher. So we were very pleased with the robustness that um, ATSC offers, even when you have a diversity of uh, data rates going on. So uh, as you'd expect, that tends to be a reduction in percentage success rate as you go out in distance. So that's uh, for one PLP, that's the other one. We get out to the more robust PLPs. And then finally, uh, the mobile data rate, it, at, the, at the very uh, far distances of up towards 60 miles, that starts falling off too. But it's exactly what you would expect, uh, that uh, the farther you are from the transmitter, uh, the, the least, least likely that you'll have 100% uh, success rate which is another advertisement for single frequency networks. You use multiple transmitters in, a, in an area, you can get reception uh, throughout the, uh, the service area. Uh, this year, layered division multiplexing, a wonderful feature of uh, ATSC 3.0, where again, you can do two things at the same time. You can take a um, particular signal that has a particular robustness, and add another signal literally on top of it with less robustness and deliver those at the same time. Now, why would you do that? Uh, there, there are a lot of business cases where you might uh, want to be doing that and um, uh, probably not the time to, to go into it, but it's a feature that we just haven't had in uh, broadcasting before to be able to have this kind of flexibility. 
But the question we wanted to explore was, well, if we do layered division multiplexing and the, the difference in dB between the uh, base layer and the enhancement layer is called the injection level, uh, what happens when we vary the injection level? Is there a particular uh, injection level for uh, LDM that is better than another? So we decided to, um, uh, to do a, a, a full test again uh, in Cleveland using uh, LDM. We went to 60 sites and um, uh, used uh, the same kind of equipment as in the previous field test. Uh, two test signals. Um, with uh, one at, at a uh, kind of a low data rate, which you might use for sending HD to fixed receivers, and another one with enhancement information that uh, was less uh, robust, but for fixed receivers might, um, might allow you to, if you combine the two signals, to do UHD 4K, whereas the, uh, the base layer you could use for a mobile service or you could use for HD service to fixed receivers. So that, that was kind of the, the proxy for the signals that we were um, uh, testing. So uh, these are the, the kind of the numbers that go with that. And so we had a little over three megabits per second for the, the core, uh, uh, core service and a little over, well, close to 10 megabits per second for the um, uh, enhancement layer. And then we had variation with one with a 3 dB injection level and one with a 9 dB injection level, which are kind of the, uh, the ends of the spectrum there. You don't want to go less than 3 dB and going uh, more than 9 dB injection level kind of makes the enhancement layer uh, too um, uh, fragile. So uh, again, this shows the, um, the percentages, the raw percentages, they're very high. They're almost 100%. It didn't really matter what the injection level was. Uh, the system works uh, really well in Cleveland out to 60 miles with uh, typical kinds of things. The thing about LDM is you can use uh, the base layer for mobile performance. So we did a sep second set of um, tests with, uh, with LDM in a vehicle. And that's a little more uh, uh, complicated, uh, especially when you do it in January. In, uh, in Cleveland, uh, where it's never very nice. It's never nice in Cleveland in the, in the winter. But uh, our uh, plan was to um, use the, uh, just the core layer, because we didn't have any chance of receiving the enhancement layer, but just use the core layer, have the enhancement layer there, vary the injection level, and see if varying that injection level made any difference on how well you could receive the, the core layer. So again, these are the, uh, the raw uh, kind of um, statistics of it. It was very high, uh, again, didn't really matter that much whether you had uh, the 3 dB or the 9 dB injection level. Uh, numbers are nice, but the thing with mobile is you can, uh, you can do these worm trail kinds of um, plots. So, so these are the, uh, happens to be the, the grid uh, in Akron, Ohio, and the drive route that we use there. Green is good, uh, black is, is no uh, reception. So you can see up there in the upper right corner, there's, uh, there's some no reception areas, and that's with a 3 dB injection level. When we change that to 9 dB, it's pretty similar. Um, where you don't have reception tends to be in the same, uh, the same places. I'm sorry, that was mislabeled. That is the Cleveland grid. Um, it says Akron, but that, they're both Cleveland. Got to fix that. Uh, here's, here's another uh, example. Going on a, a state road along the, uh, the lake there and uh, going out to, I think that's uh, 60 miles from the transmitter with uh, 3dB. So no errors all the way from the transmitter out to uh, 60 miles, which is... Uh, pretty good. You can make a service out of that. That's with 3 dB injection level. And with 9 dB, we actually got out to uh, 62 miles. So uh, if, if those two miles make any difference to you, then the injection level might, might matter. But if you really want to serve out to that 60 mile area, what's the answer? Single frequency network. That's always the answer for reliable and robust reception. So uh, our uh, test uh, results uh, overall here, we uh, provided 
coverage out to 95% in um, urban, suburban, and, and rural areas. Uh, we think probably the sweet spot of injection levels is it's not 3 dB, dB and it's not 9 dB. Somewhere between 4 and 7 is probably the right uh, uh, compromise for uh, using this mode for the, the various things that it, it is uh, good for. Um, but uh, using a low data rate robust core layer and a higher data rate robu uh, less robust enhancement layer uh, makes a lot of sense uh, where it works and where it doesn't work go to single frequency networks. We're doing other things at the, uh, at the test station in Cleveland. A lot, this was our uh, aspirational list a few months ago. A lot of those things are, are now ticked off the, the list. We've certainly done layer division multiplex um, tests now. We've uh, uh, had, um, I would say, limited success with integration of Dolby AC4. It, it's uh, harder than it seems to get AC4 working, but that is now the focus of um, most of the manufacturers of, uh, of encoders. They're working hard on that to, to make it uh, simple to use. It, it, uh, it's, uh, it's coming. Uh, we've done some advanced emergency alerting stuff with uh, Monroe Electronics, digital alert systems. Uh, targeted ads is kind of going to be um, this spring and, uh, and summer. It's a big, big area of interest. Uh, closed captioning. That's the one we have to do. Uh, FCC requires that. It's the last thing to get attention, it seems, in integrating into equipment. But we're working with the vendors to, to make that happen. Should uh, should be uh, positive there. App transmission. You, if you go over to the Futures Park area, they've got a lot of uh, app stuff uh, showing interoperability between uh, LG, Samsung, and Sony receivers for the same app. We want to do that in the in the real world and put that into Cleveland. Uh, and uh, do targeted ads and apps in uh, Cleveland this, uh, this spring and summer. <laughs> we, uh, we also have something going with Technicolor to, to do a broadcast and uh, broadband uh, hybrid service uh, so, that, so that we can uh, start to look at um, uh, scalable video coding kinds of applications. Uh, encryption and DRM is the hot topic out here, uh, getting agreement on a digital rights management system for broadcasting. And as soon as the book is closed on uh, de deciding which system and how to do it, we're going to put that into Cleveland, uh, as well as uh, some of these, these other things. Conformance testing, if you haven't been over to Eurofins, go over and take a look at their test harness. Testing um, ATSC 3.0 receivers is not like testing your grandmother's ATSC 1 receiver. You need, if you're really going to exercise the full extent of the receiver, thousands and thousands of tests. And the only way you do that is with an automated uh, kind of an environment for um, uh, testing. And uh, they're, they're showing a, um, a test harness that um, uh, can do that. So as we enter this brave new world of, of um, uh, hybrid and, and uh, internet connectivity and uh, interoperability, we're going to need some very sophisticated tools for conformance testing. We've also worked with uh, some of the program guide people, um, Titan TV and uh, Watermarks with uh, Verence. Uh, we did tests with Nielsen a few weeks ago on their, uh, their Watermark. So all these things are um, being proven out. They all work on paper. I can tell you the standard set itself is solid. There's nothing wrong with the standards. Recommended practices are coming out in ATSC to explain some of the more arcane parts of the standard. But the standard is... Um, uh, is solid. We're now moving into the, the real world part of the practical part of, of uh, deployment and um, product development. Uh, a lot of companies have been very focused on this show, as I'm sure you can appreciate that they're um, going to be, if they're not already in the marketplace, very soon they will be with a, uh, with a product that does everything that they, uh, that they want it to do. So uh, my, my summary of all this is that we think this test station in Cleveland is a good good thing. We've been validating the standard it, itself. We've been uncovering a lot of station implementation issues and uh, getting some insights into how the system performs in the field and what parameters to vary when you get into trouble. Uh, we've also been uh, learning that equipment interoperability uh, and uh, the multiple software versioning issues, especially when you have a standard that's made up of 20 individual standards that all get uh, upgraded at a, on a different 
timeline, that that's, um, that's, that's a challenge. Um, but that challenge is going to go away because as things solidify and stabilize, uh, only the early pioneering stations like ourselves and the others that are, that are out there doing this kind of work uh, are going to have to, you know, really uh, take the brunt of that, of that challenge of, you know, you're using version X and I'm using version Y and my equipment only works with version Z. So uh, that's kind of a, uh, that will tail out eventually. Uh, most of the testing we've done in, to date has been physical layer, and we are very satisfied with the physical layer capabilities and the flexibility uh, that are there. So that's a that's a good thing. Um, we um, we're finding that uh, the features that everyone wants are becoming available. Uh, it's happening in an evolutionary way, not all at once. People are just trying to get the basics down first, and then they add the bells and whistles in. So again. This show, I think, is kind of a litmus test for uh, uh, getting everything buttoned up and 100% and functional. And uh, with that, I think uh, we're ready for if there's any any questions. Brian, you're welcome to come back on the on the stage. And since I probably confused everybody, you can give them the right answer uh, for uh, what questions they they may have. So, what can we tell you about uh, the work going on in Cleveland or? ATSC 3.0 testing. It was totally clear. There's a question. Brave man. How did the VHF testing come along? I think that was like early on. Yeah, that was 2016. Um, we did that under an experimental license. The report on that testing had to be filed with the FCC. And I'm going to forget what the docket number is but we have a nice uh, you know 40 page report on how well it worked it did work uh, uh, quite well the uh, the problems with our VHF test were, were that we were in an interference limited environment uh, because we were on channel 9 which is not an allocated channel we did have some short spacing with a Canadian station a Sinclair station in, in Ohio so in places where we were going towards that interference uh, we did have some problems. We were also using equipment from Korea, uh, and as Namho will remember, since they don't use VHF in Korea, we had um, uh, uh, we, we had less of a, um, a channel nine filter on our receiver than than we probably should have. So none of that is the fault of the system, but in in implementation, uh, our percentages probably weren't were not uh, as close to 100 percent as they might have been because of the interference on adjacent channels. And that's, that's why I said one thing we learned was there is no substitute. You still need good filtering in a, in a television uh, set. ATSC can't solve, um, certainly can't solve uh, co-channel interference, although you can go to mo more robust modulations, uh, but it can't solve adjacent channel interference by, by itself. So that, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the lesson from Cleveland uh, for VHF. Uh, but that report is available if you're interested in more detail. I, I can give me a card and I'll, I'll get it to you. John Taylor. So I know in, in parallel with this joint effort and complementing this joint effort, I wanted to ask Brian uh, to tell us a little bit about what working on. Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the last part. John was asking what, um, what CTA has been working on, and, and Lynn referenced the uh, how solid the standards are and continued work in ATSC on recommended practices in parallel, of course, because the ATSC standards are primarily about the emission. There's uh, and there's many tools in the toolkit. So clearly, if you look at the standard, there's a lot more that can be done than any one receiver will do. So a, um, CTA has been plugging away now uh, in parallel, writing recommended practices for receivers. You know, we're using that effort to drive a test capability. So in here in the, in the long list that Lynn showed of, of uh, things that, that uh, he'd like to see done in the Cleveland test station, one of those items was, was uh, called test streams. So we're very interested, the industry is very interested in, in getting uh, these test streams that we will capture and integrate into a conformance test system so that as we move together towards broadcast and TVs being available in the market, we'll have a test system 
that uh, TV manufacturers can use, can run their products against. And ultimately the plan is that we will kind of brand this and message it and bring it out together into the market.